Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. Where I'm at is Miami, Florida, Doral, Florida, at the uh, one of the offices and conference rooms of the Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department Training Center. And with me, our special guest today is uh, Lieutenant Will Garcia, uh, who is He's going to explain what his uh, job is as a prob probationary development officer. The topic is mentoring, and I think we all have strong opinions and passions about that. Uh, we, have, we have another special guest with us today, uh, Kate Derniker, and uh, we're all just for us regulars, we're not going to do much of an introduction at all, just say your name, but like Kate and Will, take as much time as you want um and uh because we have the time and we, we and don't worry about time constraints and we, we run over we run over uh, a couple of shout outs um i always like to mention my buddy dave hibben uh that works for uh key hose uh he was capt a glutton for punishment uh captain of engine 10 in washington dc if you know anything about the dc fire department um Dave has got a heck of a lot of experience and now he represents key hose. And if, if you purchase key hose, you get a guy like Dave Hibben that comes to your department to assist you with flow tests and advice. And that advice is based on uh, years and years of experience. So a big shout out to Dave. And um, I also want to shout out, I was not going to be here today. I had an EMT refresher class. And uh, it's like death and taxes on my department. You can't get out of it. Okay. But I want to give a shout out to the instructor. It was a mixed group of, I'm one of the, I am one of the few non-paramedic BLS losers that's still on the fire department. So uh, they mixed us in. So kind of like a fly in the punch bowl. So this instructor was really great. And, Here's how I feel about EMS, because I, I'm not in the field anymore. If you are not able and willing to render emergency aid for, say, a seizure, a heart attack, bleeding, anything, then don't ever wear a fire department hat or shirt, anything that identifies you as a firefighter when you're out in public because you will be called to duty and it will be your duty on or off duty, whether you're in your jurisdiction or not. So I feel very strongly about that. And uh, I wanted to give a shout out to this, this instructor. He was uh, just absolutely a stellar guy and uh, explained everything in terms of hose lines and friction loss. And uh, as far as the cardiac system and the pump, and the, the sprinkler heads and the piping, it would be a bit very, uh, very uh, entertaining. So would you tell a little bit about yourself, what, what you're doing here, how you mentor? <laughs> well, uh, I've been on the department 18 years. I waited uh, very late in my career, 15 years on to become a lieutenant. And I wanted to do that because of the growth of this department, uh, the amount of uh, recruits and probationary firefighters that, that, that come out in a yearly basis is astonishing. So uh, I became a recruit instructor initially. And as a recruit instructor, you do a little bit of mentoring, but obviously you're seen as an authority figure. So, you know, you can't mingle too much with the, uh, with the probies. But then after doing multiple classes, I decided to become a probationary development officer. <laughs> as a probationary development officer, you are assigned to certain battalions. There's uh, five of us right now. We got 14 battalions. I, I handle battalion one, two, and three rotations for our probies is every three months. So every three months, the probie rotates from the north to the south, from a, a shift to B shift or C shift. So, and that's just so they get a taste of the difference in our department from the south to drafting, to the north, to high rise firefighting, things like that. Along the way, the, the, the backup that they have as a probie, and we're talking about personnel that have absolutely zero experience firefighting is their PDO officer. So I'm assigned that probationary firefighter for the three months. That probationary firefighter knows that I'm with them 24 seven. I mean, they could call us at any time with any issues and uh, we follow them through. We also bring them back 
every six months to do a midterm and to do a physical assessment that we do. And they do that during their recruit. So once they become probationary firefighters, they do it at their midpoint, six months, and then they do it at their final year. And that's just an assessment, a physical assessment, so they know how quickly this job could catch up. You know, when you become, you know, either the training goes down, the sleep deprivation, all that. So, and that's just an assessment for them. Along with that, we also do a written test that they have to do at their midpoint and at their final. So within that year, we also bring them back quarterly to do any type of training. So we cover for lay, inch and three quarter, supply line. We do it all. We do it all. And it's a lot of information. And you're talking about a probie that goes, depending on the holiday that they get into class, anywhere from 12 to 14 weeks is their SOP period. And then they go straight to a year of probation. And they're thrown out there, you know, and there's a lot. I mean, some of the stations that we choose for them are busy, busy stations. We're running averaging 15 to 20 calls a shift. So they're overwhelmed and, and overwhelmed with everything, not just the call volume being put in, in a pressure position, you know, to what do I do in my downtime? How do I manage my day, you know, so that I'm busy, so that I don't look like. So it's a constant relationship that you build as a probationary officer with that probie. And it's great because since there's five probies, I mean, uh, five probationary officers, and when they change every three months, they get a taste of the difference, you know, of experience. All of us are within over 10 years on. Uh, we have female, we have different, you know, nationalities. So it's great for them to experience the difference. Plus, we're all in different areas of the county. I've worked in the north my whole career. And we have other probationary development officers that have worked the south. So they get a little taste of that and, and more experience when they get to that area of the county. So it's always a mentoring. And it's funny that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it up, but this Sunday we had a probationary firefighter whose house actually caught on fire. And, uh, you know, he see, right now he feels like, oh, my God, I, I have nothing. But the overwhelming support from the department, from the union, I mean, you want to talk about brotherhood. You know, he's really – understanding what he's in, you know, and, and that's what we do as probationary development officers. We let them know, Hey, we're here for you. You know, you're going to be overwhelmed. We understand that as long as you do your duty, you report, you know, you stay good, you train. And if you have any questions, we're always going to be here for you to the end of your probationary year. And usually that builds, you build a relationship with them long after that, where I get constantly calls like, Hey, LT, I, I just bought my first house you know, and, and things like that, because they feel an attachment because you're with them every single step of the way. And so they're out of probation. And then obviously, once they're out of probation, it's a sign of relief that, oh, okay, I'm on permanent status. But uh, it's exciting. It's exciting. And, and I love mentoring. You know, it's one of my favorite things to do here. Uh, Kate is our other special guest. And uh, it's the first time we've met. Uh, she's been writing fire EMS articles for fire engineering. So I figured that would be a, she would be perfect for this type of uh, topic today, mentoring. Uh, Kate, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure, Bill. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, my background goes all the way back to the early 70s when I got involved um, in, in, in sort of almost every aspect of emergency services. My first paid job was as a dispatcher. So happy, happy emergency communicator week to everybody. We love you. Um, and then I worked as a paramedic in Denver for a number of years and um, search and rescue along the way, mountain search and rescue and also search and rescue back in uh, Michigan where I live now. Um, and my, my latest um, rotation was as an EMT firefighter for a small town in Michigan for about eight years. Um, I'm retired now and all I do is medical death investigation is my final career path at the moment. But I um, have been writing for this industry for since the 1970s and uh, most recently with fire engineering. So I'm pleased to be aboard. Um, my, my background in, on the topic of today on mentorship, um, I was thinking about a couple of angles I could talk about um, as, a, um, as a mentorship as a, as a process that is, I love what I'm hearing from you, Will, because it's, it has a lot to do with training. It has a lot to do with bringing people along who are maybe at the front end of their career and really entering with just a blank slate and to have good guidance from the get-go 
uh, to me through a good mentor is um, something that everybody should have access to in this business, but it's unfortunately not so. Um, I think that many of us know of, of um, you know, people who tried it out and, and washed out because they just felt they didn't ever feel that um, come along, we'll teach you how to do this. They, they felt more like the uh, judged all the time or harshly maybe hazed or back in the bad old days, you know, some of the things that have gone on in this industry. So um, to have a good mentor, to have somebody that can lead you along, um, it's really a very formal relationship that, um, that in, in the best and most accurate circumstances is defined. Uh, I will be your mentor, you will be my mentee. This is what um, I'm agreeing to do and this is what you need to do, agree to do for me. So it's a mutual agreement. There are roles that, um, that are offered up and as the mentor, any, any department out there that's not doing this on their intake is missing, the, missing great chances to bring people on board in a way that's gonna keep them around. Because with um, so many people leaving the field uh, and, and maybe it's because they just didn't uh, have someone to turn to when things got tough. And that's what a mentor does is that mentor is there for them. I mean, this, is, this job is physical, it's emotional, it's behavioral, it's social. You know, and if you can't sort of work your way in in all those various ways, it can be kind of tricky to feel successful, even despite the brotherhood. And I, I, miss, I miss my brothers that I, I saw for so frequently, and I, I'm still in touch with, of course, all of them. But um, I'm also glad to see that it looks like that my way or the highway era hopefully has been uh, diminished over time and that, that better processes of bringing people on board are, are occurring. So I'll stop I agree with you, Kay. Uh, we talk about the, the, the good old days. Bravo, Sierra. Good old days. Those were the bad old days. <laughs> the hazing, the subordinating of people, mm -hmm. the intimidating of people, withholding information, ostracizing people uh, based on race, gender, ethnicity. Right. Eth Ethnicity. Mm -hmm. ethnicity, false teeth, false teeth. Okay, ethnicity. Uh, all those were bad old days. Keep your mouth shut, rookie. Those are bad old days. These are the good old days. And we've got uh, two classes running right now. That uh, when they when they leave, get out into the field. I will put these young people up against anybody. anybody. And right. thank God for the CPAT, yeah. which stands for what? Candidate physical ability test. Because that is even the playing field, okay? Admittedly, we used to cut females slack and we had lower standards. Not anymore and not in the last, uh, God, what? Yeah. Almost 20 years, 20 years now? 20 years, yeah. 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 They are, they're all judged by the same standard, mm -hmm. held, held to the same standard. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm gonna ask one of my mentors a wise old sage. And by the way, I feel very strongly that a mentor can be somebody that has less time on the job than, uh, than you do and uh, can be younger. For instance, um, Jay Nunez, yeah, my Tony Garcia. Yeah, Tony okay. I, I was a, they came out, I was a captain when they came on the job. Yeah. So, or at least a Lieutenant. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but one of my mentors is right there. This, this big guy with this walrus mustache, this captain, Mike Dugan, and uh, God, we, we do solve the world's problems uh, on the phone uh, just about every week we talk. And so, Mike, what's your thoughts and feelings and uh, experience with, with mentorship? And who's made a difference in your career? I can't tell you the number of people who have made a difference in my career. Um, what, my first captain, Danny Marshall, taught me how to be a fireman, taught me what was expected of me, not because of what he said, but because of what he did. He not only talked the talk, he walked the walk. And he always told me, I'm there for you, but you have to come talk to me. You have to ask me. If you're having a problem, you have to come see me. You have to be honest with me. He was my first captain. He taught me what to do. The senior men, when I was a fireman in a 43 truck, taught me what they wanted me to do. Now, one of the things we've had a problem with in the fire service for many years is the unwritten rules for the probies. When I was a captain, I came into a great company, 123 Truck, and they had the Proby Bill of Rights, the Proby's assignments for the day tour, for the night tour, 
what they expected of you, what they wanted you to do. It was spelled out. It was in a thing. You came in as a pro B and they told you what they expect you to do. You signed it and the captain signed it with you. And they told you what they expected you to do. Uh, Vinnie Dunn was one of my mentors. He got my first article published for me. He always said to me, you know, you wrote this great thing for the FDNY. And the FDNY said, who the hell is this dumb kid who's a fireman? Who do, what does he know? They threw it in the waste paper basket. Vinnie Dunn read it as it went through the chain of command and said, can I get this published outside the job? Because sometimes you can't be a prophet in your own land. And he helped me. I can't tell you the number of people. John Salka, it goes on and on. Now, what I will tell you about mentorship that I love is when I was involved in the FDNY with the leadership programs in the FDNY, when you get promoted to lieutenant in the FDNY, you go to FLIPS, First Line Supervisors Training Program, and you do six weeks of school at FLIPS. And we always said, and the same thing at the captains, when you go to the captains, when you get promoted to captain, you do four weeks offline to get the leadership, to get your things down there. It's time for you to rework your network because you and I are captains. We're going through the same program exchange information, phone numbers. And we call it in the FDNY, phone a friend. If something's going on and you're scared, those people you know, those Vinnie Dunn's, those Bill Gustin's, those Jason Holbermans, all of these guys, you call one of them and say, hey, listen, I got this problem. I'm in the firehouse. I don't know what the hell to do. What do you recommend? And these are people, a lot of times, who have been there before and have done this. These are your mentors. So your network has to include people who are in the same place you are. If you're a uh, captain and all your friends on the job are firefighters, you've never, you don't have another captain that you can go to, it's a problem for you. You have to have your network of like people and people above you that you can go to. Not saying you can't be friends with firefighters, don't take me wrong, but it's that we have to have a network of people in the same area who are dealing with the same things, with the issues of today. Listen. When you and I came up, Bill, there was no such thing as social media. Being social meant we sat down and talked. Now we text. Now we FaceTime. Now we do things. It's Social media is unsocial. It's antisocial. But we have to get together. We have to sit down. One of my favorite things about being in the firehouse is we used to have chips, poker chips on the table. After the meal, the junior man had to pick a poker chip, and they'd have a number on them. And it would be 10, 15, 20. Those were the number of minutes we have to sit. If we didn't get a run, we'd have to sit and talk. I got I to gotta, I gotta talk to Jason? Oh, my God. What am I going to say? Clark, I don't know. I got to talk to Clark? I got to ask him a question? I don't know. You know, Daryl and I have to discuss something? Oh, my God. Okay. I got to go see on my cell phone. You know, somebody might have updated Twitter today. Absolutely. Cell phones are not allowed in the firehouse kitchen. OK, again, we have to get back to that brotherhood and that sisterhood. We have to get back to where we communicate to each other and where we get together. And our mentors have to be up, down and on the same level that we are. And we have to have those people we can look to, because when things go wrong, those are the people who are going to bail you out and help you find your way. And Dan Shaw. A name pops into my head, and I'm going to guess he has influenced you. Two names, uh, Larry Schultz and uh, Ricky Riley. Yeah. Would that would I be accurate in saying that yeah. they made an influence on your career? 100%. Uh, I mean, and that's the beauty of uh, what we do, right? I mean, those guys, uh, Ricky and I worked together as firefighters and then uh, he was uh, the guy who drove the ladder truck and I was the engine driver and we were each other's necks every single day, uh, which was fantastic. Uh, it, it kept us both honest and it kept us both accountable. Um, and, and, and that's the beauty of like what we're doing here. It's a beauty of what Sam and I get to do teaching together in traditions is that it, it's the same circus, different clowns. Everyone's dealing with the same exact things. So to be able to have a network of people who, uh, who are not within your organization and don't live in a vacuum that you can go have a, a frank, honest conversation with, and you know that they're dealing with the same exact things. 
uh, and then be able to gain and learn from their experiences. I mean, just to, even this this uh, group we have here from the size of our departments, uh, you know, they span the globe, but we all deal the same issues. It's just scalability. You know, some are going to be see this a lot, some that are often seen. And, that, and that's the, the beauty of it is, you know, a lot of times you don't even get to pick who your mentors are. I mean, it's nice when you have a formal process, but when you meet that person who just naturally does this because they're more invested about treating you who you are, not who you are right now, but who they think you could be, uh, is tremendous. And, that, and I go back to, um, you know, when we had to write the, the acknowledgments for when Doug and I did our book, um, you know, had to go back and think, who would you think? And obviously you thank your family, which is, you know, tremendous through the support network. But 15, 20 years later, the only name kept coming back to my name was a guy named Andy Liebno, who works with Larry now, who's a firefighter uh, in his department. But he was a paid firefighter uh, in the place where I started volunteering in Howard County. And unbeknownst to me, at 16 years old, I didn't realize what he was doing, but I wanted to ride the rescue squad. They had a process with the volunteers. He said, no, he was a paid guy who was there 24 hours. And every evening, he'd tell me to be there at 1,900 hours. And from 1,900 hours until about 10 o'clock, we'd do one compartment on a rescue company. And he would make sure I knew everything, soup to nuts about it, everything about the why, uh, so I could develop a level of mastery. Uh, and this was a guy who was a paid firefighter who didn't have to do it. And he did it for a particular reason, because uh, he had faith in who I was, invested all his knowledge into me, uh, and that resonated with me. And he was the first guy, uh, when we, we had a class back up here, that tried to track down. And the irony of it was, is that he was at our class, so he could bring his two sons, who now were in their late teens, to the class to hear from Doug and I. Unbeknownst to him, he didn't realize the impact he had on me. And that's, you know, it was a great moment, was to be able to go back to his sons, and say, the reason I'm here is because of your father. It's because your father invested in me that he, he showed me with this level of mastery was, that was expected. So you know, even what we would think is a formal mentoring program is fantastic to have, but it's just the ability of an individual to be able to see someone and see that they can do some great stuff and get the best out of them and just invest time. I mean, it, you can't, there's no currency better than time when you invest time in people. Um, and and that, that, that's a great aspect of when we're talking about mentoring uh, and a lot of this uh, is, uh, I mean, one of these things that's sorely missing is like talent management. You know, how well do, do we do in talent management in the fire service? Of looking at individuals and saying, hey, you have the potential, I think, to be the next fire chief. What we can we do to get you to this point? And some of that is because we've become a little gun shy to discrimination or bias that why would I do this? But no, I mean, it's good to rep recognize that certain people are going to be great at these certain things and they have the ability to get to, let's give them the tools and not to deprive other people, but have some talent management because then what's going to happen. You get to the point of, Hey, now the, the leader is going to leave because their time is up and who's the next person. Uh, I don't know. We didn't prepare anyone for this. Uh, and that's always problematic, but you know, long winded, but yeah, no, absolutely. Those two guys, uh, tremendous impact, still have a tremendous impact, even to today. When you you know, you alluded to Doug, and you alluded to your book. Huh? Uh, would you tell us a little bit about your book? Yeah. Uh, um, you can shamelessly, I mean, you have no problem uh, shaming, uh, shamelessly promoting traditions training, so I'm what? sure you can shamelessly <laughs> promote, you can shamelessly you promote 25 <laughs> to survive, and our mutual friend, uh, Doug Mitchell, what uh, uh, and Doug's background. And Doug's background. Yeah, I mean Doug's a perfect example. So he and I were volunteers together. Um, you know, we came up through the same system. We were separated by two months of coming into the volunteer department together. Uh, we both went to Fairfax. He will tell you that he was in the 89th recruit school. I was in the 90th recruit school. Um, and then he, you know, his, his dad was in the FDNY, and that was home for him. So he went back to the FDNY in '99, uh, where he's at now. He's a captain in the FDNY. But he's my brother from another mother. I mean, even though we work in different places, uh, I probably talk to him at least three to four times a week. Um, I had the pleasure of teaching with him. And uh, when we got the opportunity to write the book, neither one of us are authors by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but we just we had recognized that there was um, you know, systemic issues that were all related across the country, regardless of your paid volunteer, large, small, didn't matter, that were leading the line of duty deaths and close calls. Um, and and there, there's a commonality to it. 
And unlike a lot of things we see in the fire service, and that was some of our frustration, is that when you know people will roll in and they'll write a report and they'll say, you did this wrong, this wrong, this wrong, and you should get six on a ladder truck. I can barely get two. How about you give me something tangible that's a drill or an idea that I can do in my firehouse right now that might change that behavior that I can get that to this point. And so we were given the great opportunity by fire engineering to take our class uh, and put it into a book because we're so passionate about the fact that if we really want to truly lead, end or stop line of duty deaths, then let's identify the problem and then give you solutions. Um, but the, the best part about it was uh, it was an easy ride because, you know, both Doug and I uh, think very alike. I mean, obviously he's from New York, so there's a lot of stories that probably are half true. Um, and I'm a son of an English teacher, so it's like get to the point. But it was great to be able to write it with a, a great friend and a, a mentor. Yeah, I know that, uh, oh, well, Kate, we just got, got to know you, but every one of you wonderful guys are, are, are my mentor. And we did have a hashtag there that uh, you don't have to be an officer to be a mentor. Yeah, I've, I've got, uh, in fact, I, I highly recommend you go to YouTube uh, and take a look at uh, Gordon Graham's uh, dissertation. It's about a two, three minute dissertation on the senior firefighter. The senior firefighter by Gordon Graham, and, and he gets it. And um, how you fit in, the role that the senior firefighter plays. And if you are that senior firefighter, the immense responsibility that you have if you want to do your job correctly. Sam Hiddle, are you your son's mentor now that he's a firefighter with Wichita? I, I think you'd have to ask him. Um, I think when it comes to uh, mentoring, um, to get into semantics, you know, I, I think that it's important that departments assign people to uh, to help navigate the waters um, when you enter the organization. But me personally, I consider those people advisors. Um, that's kind of more of a almost a formal management. You know, I'm I'm going to tell you uh, how to survive here. Um, whereas when I personally look at a mentor, it's, uh, it's an attribute that I went to them. Um, I think as mentors, you can reach out to people, but ultimately to be mentored, the receiver has to go back to that individual and say, I want to emulate um, what you do. I want to emulate how you behave, or I want to understand tactics at the level that you do. And so that's where the relationship part uh, begins. Uh, so to answer your question, I, I think you'd really have to ask him. I, I don't know if he's uh, if he sees me that way or not. Well, I uh, I had a mentor, but it was my dad. And uh, I'll give you three Bill Gustinisms. I said one day, Dad, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm really tired of just reading about firefighting and tactics and building construction. I can't wait to get on a busy company on the Chicago fire department. So I can actually, I can put the books down and I can learn by experience. He says, wait a minute, young man, don't ever think, don't ever think that uh, you'll go to enough fires for you to learn everything, learn why you burn out of, out of your own experience. You have to learn from other people's experience. And, uh, and then he said, and by the way, I'm trying to find, I have to use a euphemism here because I, I can't say the word he used. I know firefighters that go to two to three working fires a day and they're some of the dumbest. I know. Okay, we'll leave it at that. So we can, we can censor that. Uh, well, Sam, uh, I do like that hair, that hat. And uh, when you go back to your newspaper stand this afternoon, uh, you got the right hat for the right job. Uh, we've got our... our Brother over there, Chief Hovelman from America's Heartland. And uh, what are your thoughts? And uh, what, what's your, tell a little bit, just a little bit about yourself and then what your thoughts are, experiences on, on mentoring. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm in my 26th year as a career firefighter. I'm the fire chief um, in a career fire department in North St. Louis County, volunteered uh, for over 30 years, started as a kid. And um, I, it's, it's hard to add to what's been said already, but some things that I had thought about and written down is I, for us, and what I've found to be very valuable is a, kind of an informal approach uh, to mentoring in that it's a lot of times it's opportunistic. 
between the mentor and mentee, uh, meaning that there's a certain situation, for example, maybe I've got a battalion chief who's got like the inset potential. And, um, and, I, and I, I take something from a book I read called um, Nine Lies About Work, and it takes potential and makes you look at momentum uh, because people who are eager and enthusiastic and are moving may not have as much potential as somebody, but they're working really hard. Um, and, and so we, you know, I may have somebody that's like that and I may be dealing with a, uh, a budget issue that's going to affect something two or three years down the road. And I can just tap that, that officer on the shoulder and say, hey, let me show you something. And, and, you know, we've been talking about this particular issue and it is all levels of the organization. Um, and, and here's how it might impact us in three years. And here's why. And, and, and it's those little moments that hopefully the, the intent, at least what I've been taught by many of you on this screen, is that um, the best mentors I've had ask, make me ask a lot of questions uh, and make me be inquisitive. And they don't always give me the answers. In fact, that's rare. They lead me to find the answers. Um, and, and so in my opinion, it's hard to do that with a formal platform. Uh, not that mentoring programs aren't great, but I find that those informal communications and those informal opportunities that just kind of pop up. And if you're not paying attention or don't have a little bit of um, uh, thoughtfulness to the idea that, hey, I can offer this piece of information, no matter how mundane it might seem. Um, but, to, you know, and, and from a tactical standpoint, for example, and some would call this training, some would call it a lot of things. But I kind of look at it as mentoring. I had a conversation with a brand new captain about a fire that got into the ease of an exposure. And he was showing me pictures and uh, there were two bedroom windows on that side of the house. And I said, hey, just keep in mind when you're hitting those E's, stay away from those windows, they're intact. And it was something he hadn't thought of before. And it's those opportunities to be able to pass along knowledge. And then the hope is that they come back uh, and ask more questions and are more um, inquisitive and thoughtful about their own trajectory. Um, and then keep feeding it, you know, and that's just just kind of my take on it. And, and, and it's worked from the, the folks of you that are on here that are certainly mentors of mine. Um, it, it's that's the process that's been very helpful to me. And, and I owe many and most of you uh, a debt of gratitude for where I am today. Well, look, that's great. Great. Uh, we're about at the halfway point. Just want to give a shout out to Key. That's a keyhose.com. Uh, we have a buildings that are going in there for exclusivity, big word, 50 cents, please. Uh, they have very little hallway, if at all. In fact, uh, we have some buildings and I know that uh, Captain Mike has buildings like this that are very, have a very small footprint, but are very tall. And each uh, floor encompasses a single unit, a single residence. Well, that gets to be problematic because where are you going to lay your hose out? You have a very small landing. Are you going to have to lay it in the stairs? Whatever it is, you're going to have a space problem and you're going to need hose with uh, excellent kink resistance. And this is where the key combat ready and the key true ID. Uh, I say this on every one of these, these hangouts. Take the key challenge. Try your combat ready or combat sniper. The combat ready is 1.88. Uh, so it's, it's bigger than inch and three quarter. The combat sniper is, uh, it's a, uh, it's a through the weave with the extrusion with a, a jacket for heat and abrasion resistance. Uh, but it, it's happy space is uh, about 160 gallons a minute. If that's what your department uses for target flow. And of course it's, a little bit more maneuverable and a little bit lighter. So I wanted to give a shout out to uh, to Key. And then uh, here's a here's a young guy that's a mentor, a mentor to me. And uh, Clark Lamping, how many medical calls have you run today in the absence of your uh, rescue? We've had four already, Cap. Um, yeah, we have a, uh, I don't know how this happened, but they're doing an Air National Guard drill in the 6th Battalion today, and out of five engines, we have three of them out of service participating in this drill. So the chances of me completing this Google chat are very, very slim. Um, so uh, thanks always for inviting me. 
and I appreciate all the kind comments, Cap, but uh, absolutely, you're probably the most important person in my career. So I just want to thank you for that, as well as everyone else on this panel. Um, I have a question for uh, anyone who's listening and the people on the panel. Uh, we have a very formal mentor program, mentorship program. It sounds very similar to what you guys have in Miami. Hang on. This dispatch is for engine 38. I'm out. 38. Um, <laughs> cardiac arrest. Um, anyway, what are we doing after the first year? On my job, we have a very sought out plan for the probationary firefighters after one year. I've noticed that second and third year, we had tend to have a lull in training and motivation. Um, so I just want to know, does anyone have a continual formal mentorship program after that first year? You guys talk about that. I'll catch you up on the okay, uh, recording. Clark. Take care, brothers. Thank All you. All right, brother. All right, take care. Stay safe. Clark and I uh, discussed this the other day, and uh, it is true that, uh, and we see it. We see it. Will, Will and I see it, where we have um, uh, good recruits. It's sad to see that we see new people that are in the best shape of their life, and then you don't see them for a while, and then a year later, they're fat. It should be the, you should be in better shape. We've got, this is, I tell these recruits, you are receiving free training that you would have to pay hundreds of dollars for a four hour session. Uh, yesterday they were cutting roofs, mm -hmm. day before to run the rotary saw. Free, an exclusive gym membership. They're paying you to work out. I mean, you got it made. So we give you that gift of physical fitness don't blow it for god's sake you should be in uh better shape the best shape of your life and maintain that physical level of physical conditioning kate i'd like to get back to you and uh to discuss a little bit more about um some of the issues that you have dealt with as far as yourself going reaching out to people and people reaching out to you um primarily concerning some of the problems that come with um, delivering EMS. And I, I think Will said it very aptly that it, it's not just, um, it's your whole life because what happens in your personal life does affect your performance as a, uh, a firefighter, a medic, an EMT. So yeah. um, Kate, can you give us some examples of, of where you think somebody's made a difference for you or where you've helped somebody else? Well, I, yeah, thanks for that. Um, uh, and I, I have it on my, on my mind a little bit that post first year. Can I just make a quick comment there? Sure. Um, uh, very few people who graduate from school ever read another book. Uh, most people who earn a black belt think they have finished in their martial art training. And you know, probationary, you get off probation in the fire service and you figure you're done. So what we need to do is alter that perception and um, help black belts understand that that only means that they are just beginners. They've finished being beginners. And if we could get that message across to probies as well, that you have only finished being a beginner. You're not really there yet and you never will be. Um, that might be one way to start. But in terms of reaching out um, in a delivery of you know, just how to, how to be in this business, whether it's the EMS side or fire EMS or straight fire, or um, for me, having been in a volunteer fire service situation where we were expected to be able to do all the jobs, depending on who showed up at, on a given call, you might be driving, you might be running the pump panel, you might be first line in whatever. But um, I think that one of the reach out opportunities that I really feel strongly about is, is, in, uh, is good communication. If we can, and, and I, I think my opportunities have largely come from writing and speaking to that, to various audiences as over the year, over the years. Um, I saw Bobby holding up a copy of my book. Thanks, Bobby. Um, but you know, when, when uh, we all get into our little bunkers in our minds of this is, I'm a firefighter and that's what that means to me without sort of reaching out to the people on, on the left and on the right, um, continually, uh, then, then I think we lose opportunities to be the best teams that we can be. And um, it takes a little bit of leadership. Thanks, thanks Bobby, there it is. Uh, it takes a lot of leadership to keep, um, 
any team uh, functioning well. And that begins with your probies uh, and, and their mentoring. Um, I think that um, having, having very uh, specific processes uh, through that first year or through probation that needs to somehow be, translate into a further effort um, as you go forward. I know when I joined um, Ada Fire in Michigan, um, small town, 25 people on the roster. Um, I came in obviously as a female and as an older person. So I had two hits against me and I was a little nervous about that, but um, honestly, the, the reception was, was admirable. They, they didn't, I never felt othered. I felt like here, this is, this is the best way to get through this evolution. Here's some tips. Let me help you with uh, how this is gonna feel when you <laughs> pull the handle on the hose and you get knocked back and someone's back hand was always on my back. So um, delivery of the skills that we have to do, whether it's EMS or fire, um, you know, it's, it's not embedded naturally. You do have to learn them. And um, I, I love, you know, the idea that I saw it in the in the uh, chat that you know you always want to look for that person who does it better than you do and and drive yourself, but if you see someone on your team who's not driving themselves, who is fat after the you know six months after they come out of probation, there needs to be a mechanism for reaching out that's acceptable in the organization and non-threatening and non-judgmental, but which is uh, indicating that you belong here and we want you here and you're not quite measuring up right now. So how that evolves in every team is a little different. But I think that's a lot about what we're talking about today. Daryl Liggins is a, today Daryl Liggins in Oakland, California is a stranger in paradise <laughs> because he is a career engine man. And today he is on a fire apparatus that bends in the middle. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, Daryl? And, uh, what rig you're riding today, Stranger in Paradise? I, I think uh, people that listen to this podcast know me. Uh, I'm Daryl Liggins. I, it's my 28th year in the fire service. I work in, in Oakland, California as a captain at uh, Engine 13, which is our last year was our busy. Uh, we were the busiest single engine house. So we're going to ride that until we're not. <laughs> They don't give you any extra pay for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm working a mandatory overtime shift here at the neighboring firehouse, which is a, a truck six and engine 18. So. Well, Daryl, if you get a, a, a fire, are, are, are you, are you going to know what to do? Because you're <laughs> not going to have a hose line. You're not going to be on a hose line. Uh, yeah. I'm going to be without water, which I don't like to be without water. I always want to be with water. Uh, the crew had an interesting fire this morning in a, uh, a fallout shelter that was built in the 50s. Um, on, in the fallout shelter, it was labeled uh, one man and 12 women were to be in this fallout shelter. Uh, so very inter interesting district. We got a little bit of, uh, of everything. So I don't know if I uh, feel uh, uh, happy or sorry for that, that one man. <laughs> but I want to give a, I'm gonna give a shout out I saw, I think you call them hashtags. Kevin Story. If that's the Kevin Story I know, the cranky old man from Houston that uh, was originally from Illinois. And then um, I believe he was retired for Engine 8, I believe, in Houston. Quite a, uh, you're shaking your head, uh, Chief Holman, Kevin Story. Do you know Kevin Story? Well, Kevin Story, oh, yeah. if you're out yeah. there, bro. We wish you well. God bless you, man. And uh, you're let me do some high rise that. training with him. I got family. My wife's got family down there. And when I would go down, uh, I would hook up with Kevin and, and do some high rise training and, and meet up with him and his company. Phenomenal fire officer. Yeah. If you ever get a chance to attend a class talk or hands on uh, by Kevin Story, a retired captain from um, Houston, he was also a uh, I think he's still on his volunteer fire department. So, Will, now, can I ask you, what are some of the problems or issues that the probationary folks come up with? And what, how do you tune people up? I think we all know that. Right. <laughs> so, I think the most difficult part 
of their probationary period, believe it or not, is the actual crews that they work with. So we've all, you know, we've all been firefighters for a while. And uh, you could be in one crew and have a gun hole crew that's ready to, to drill at any point, ready to respond to the fire in a second. And then you have that other crew that's all day screaming and hollering about the one call that they just ran, you know? And unfortunately, they pick up those habits, you know, and then we bring them out, like I said, to do various trainings. And the way we train with our probationary fires, fighters, it's standard across the board. So whatever they were taught in recruit training is what we go over again, whether they learn more advanced techniques out in operations, but we have to set a standard so that we bring in probationary firefighters from all over the county, from the north, from the south, and they have to be able to do the same forward lay that everybody learns. Whether you learn the shortcut or not, we don't apply that shortcut. That's just experience that you put. And then at the end of that drill, we'll bring up, hey, did anybody else learn something new, something out in operations? And then we highlight that specific thing that they learned. So not, you know, remove them from learning extra things, but also to not give the probationary firefighters that aren't at those busy houses that factor of jealousy and why am I not there? You know, we, we have 150 rookies right now all over the county. And it's hard to get 150 rookies to learn everything at the same time and learn that level. It is just impossible because like I said, different units are, you know, teach different things. So the way we reprimand them is by bringing them out. And when they do the evaluation, we purposely will put a person from the South with a person from the North so that we can see what they're going to do. And typically somebody will do it different, you know, cause either they forgot what they learned in recruit training, or they forgot what they just learned at that station. And then they mix it up. You know, it's the ones that just do what they're supposed to do that they learn in recruit training that outshine the other ones. But you know, it's, it's, it's always a learning process. I agree with Clark and Kate uh, that when you achieve, you made probation, you graduated from the academy, or you got the lieutenant's mm -hmm. badge or captain's mm -hmm. bugles, it's just the beginning. And uh, I think the best example of that is if you were to go to my station that I re retired out of when I went into the training mm -hmm. uh, division, is station two. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are vet veteran guys for the most part. And every afternoon in the heat of the Miami summer tropical heat, they're out and they are drilling really? and they've got hose on the ground and ladders up against that training tower. And these are experienced, highly skilled veteran firefighters that are never satisfied that it is just good enough. And all three shifts are that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, just an incredible bunch of guys. And uh, I was so proud to be their captain for uh, one month short of 30 years. Um, you, yes, sir. I just want to say something about this mentoring that I think we have to hit on just a little bit. Go ahead. And I think that your company, my company, uh, any company that's in there, the senior person of that company that's on that shift. A lot of times it's the apparatus operator, the driver, the chauffeur, whatever you want to call them. It doesn't matter. That person is a mentor and he's mentoring the brand new officer who comes in, who's sitting next to him, who he's probably got more time on the job or she's got more time on the job sitting in that chauffeur's seat than that person becoming the new officer. But they're there and they mentor. And for our newly promoted captains, lieutenants, and our chiefs going into those other people in the battalion where they're coming in as a new person. Don't forget, mentoring goes up. You mentor up, but it also goes back down. The people below you can mentor up and make sure you talk to those people and find out. Because if you come into a new place, let's just say I come out of Midtown Manhattan in New York City, all high rise, huge buildings. I know stamp pipes, I know everything else. And then I go out to Queens and I get to an area with Queen Anne, Victorian style homes or private dwellings, total different animals, different where the people are gonna go, different what my people are gonna do. Until I know how they operate, I'm not gonna know as a brand new officer working there what's going on. 
that mentorship is a two-way street and it goes up and down the ranks. And we have to make sure that we enable that as officers, as chiefs, and the senior firefighter. You have to, you have to pass that knowledge on. If you know something and don't share it, nobody gets better. If you share it, we all get better. You know, to dovetail with what Mike just threw out there, <clears throat> Marty Strauss out of a Brewer Fire Company in New York, Volunteer Fire Company, they actually made that senior person a position with those exact responsibilities, Mike. So uh, Marty shared that with me during the conversation, uh, shot me a, a note and uh, really just really, really that's really brilliant, Bobby. Stuff. Yeah, you don't have to have a, doesn't have to be a you know career job, volunteer job, doesn't matter. You know, M Morty pointed out at Brewer Fire Company, that senior position does exactly what Mike just said, takes that institutional knowledge and makes sure, because who's closest to the to the new to the new guy? That senior firefighter. And uh, just the just a great piece of that mentor puzzle. There's something and Dan, I Dan, I did get the, the new book hot off the presses. So <laughs> just kidding. When, when we said An inside we're, uh, joke with Dan and I, so I had I had to I had to give him a hard time. When it came around that we were going to be talking about mentorship, which is you know seems far off the uh, the topic of engine operations or truck operations, I I decided let me let me look up this definition. And so to define it, it says an experienced person in a company, college or school who trains and counsels new employees or students, which makes it sound like it's always gotta be a, a supervisory type formal position. But one thing that it definitely lacks is what it takes to be a mentor, which has gotta be approachable, non-judgmental, you know, kind, which isn't probably a word always used, uh, you know, by a, a senior firefighter or something. And in, in Oakland, we don't have a formal mentorship program for probationaries or, or officers or battalion chiefs, except for when you promote to captain, you're supposed to uh, mentor a, a lieutenant, which, um, you know, they tried to formalize that. And, and like we said earlier, there is a lot of problems trying to formalize mentorship. And um, I think when a lot of us are thinking about who are mentors to us, because we are all mentees and that's that second road we were talking about, it's a two way street. And I think most of the responsibility, I have not written a book, <laughs> but so Kate, let me know if you disagree, but it seems like most of the responsibility falls on the mentee to be open-minded and the mentee definition said to advise, uh, tr uh, to be advised, trained or counseled. So when does that ever stop in your career? It, that never stops that you wanna be advised, trained or counseled. And earlier I, uh, Mike mentioned, uh, you know, he has many, many mentors. I think we would all uh, not want to just start saying names because we're going to leave somebody out because there's so many names of people that have mentored us, but we have to always remain open-minded and, and realize that I think Mike said it's a network of people. And um, I would advise any mentee to think of it as a network. Cause like my father is, you know, one of, one of my mentors, you know, or I wouldn't be in this job. Um, he was a union man that uh, was the vice president of a grocery, large grocery store union. He was a manager of a grocery store, knew how to manage a lot of people. But the other thing is just not just think within the department. There's, I get in touch with people from our electric company, an elevator company, you know, people in public works. Um, uh, there's people I seek to get information from on personnel issues. Um, and that's not the same person I'm going to talk to about, you know, truck operations or union issues. And those people I seek to reach out to, they're always going to be somebody that's approachable and not going to judge me on whatever question I have. Because I realize, hey, you're the expert on this or subject matter expert. And that's why I'm seeking to you. And as far as being experienced, in my experience, it's been highly overrated. Because there, 
uh, I think a lot of people would know the firehouse in my department if they were listening to this. I started at a firehouse where they were highly experienced. They were going to a lot of jobs. It was full of a lot of a-holes that uh, they were not going to be able to pass on any of their experience because they were not approachable. Nobody really wanted to ask them any type of questions. But this next firehouse over, the one I happen to be sitting in right now, very approachable. You know, they, they didn't judge you on that. They wanted to learn. They took that opportunity to try and learn themselves and practice themselves and included themselves in the crew. So realize it's not all about experience, because if you can't pass on that experience, you're just withholding it for yourself. Uh, you nailed something. You nailed something, Daryl. Um, we've made relationships with um, the chief electrical inspector for the uh, building department, uh, the mechanical inspector that deals with uh, smoke control systems and um, uh, HVAC, um, people from water and sewer department about water mains and and a network of people that uh, I can pick up a phone and they do the same for me. And these are highly experienced. It's, it's their specialties that are outside the, the fire service, but they are pertinent to us. Uh, all the, although these guys are not firefighters. Uh, you know, it's not a good idea to always, that's, I think that's some of the problems with cops. And they do this for a number of reasons, but you don't always want to hang around with the same people, with the same, because you won't grow. You, you won't grow if, if you just, you, de you develop almost like a tribal type of, of uh, mentality, where if you just hang around in a small cliquish group, uh, you start to exclude things because uh, the other thing is, another Bill Gustinism, my dad, is don't hang around with a bunch of idiots. Uh, somebody made the comment, uh, associate with people that are smarter than you, that will bring you up. All you folks bring, bring me up and my kids in school. Uh, one of the reasons that they're, they are so successful, my son and daughter are so successful, is that they were in the gifted program, all with the same kids from kindergarten all the way up through senior and high school, same kids. And those kids were superstar students where their parents were really involved in their education. And to this day, they're lifelong friends. Hey, so, Bill, uh, and I, think, I think you hit something on there that, uh, again, everything's so cyclical in the fire service, right? I mean, very few, few times do we invent something new. And I go back to, uh, and Bobby would appreciate if you're still on, but, but like the Stoics, right? You know, Seneca, all these famous Stoics, you know, talked all about this. And one of those quotes is really so, uh, I think, hits right to what we're talking about is that man cannot learn something he thinks he already knows. Uh, and, and the important part of that is like what gets in the way of a lot of our people is egos. They can't remove the ego because this is their sole identity. I am, I am the senior person. I have years of experience. You remove the ego, get the pride out of the way, you realize that everything we do in our job is about impact. No one cares about your number of accolades or awards when you leave. They care about the impact you have on others. And once you can be able to do that, you recognize you might learn something from that new person, but also what do you have all this knowledge for? What are you going to do when you retire? Tell your, tell your wife, my wife could care less about what I do in my job. So you might as well invest in the people you lead every single day. And I think ultimately it comes down to, and I think uh, Kate hit on this, it's about mastery, right? Um, you know, we get to a level of mastery and people so often confuse what mastery is, is mastery is a process. It's not the end point. And you were always looking to achieve mastery. That's like you get to the top of the mountain. You're like, I got here. And then the clouds part, you're like, ah, oh, there's a summit up there. And it just keeps getting further and further away. But that's what we love about this. And the minute you can take the ego out of the equation, the better you will be and you'll realize like, hey, you know, you don't have to wait till you're the pinnacle of your career and go, okay, now I got to focus on what I can do. Because like we talked about leadership, it's not the number of people you leave in your wake, it's the number of people you're bringing with you. Uh, and that's, you know, one of the, the great honors I get as a, uh, as a deputy is I get to go around and give all the probies their black shields. Um, so when they go from the red shield of probationary time to the black shield, I never give any of the probies their shield. 
I, uh, you know, I give them all the accolades, tell them it's a great achievement. Uh, I tell them, you know, really two things they have to do is you always have to be a student of this trade, never stop learning every single day. And two, the day the new probie walks in here, guess who they're coming to? They're coming to you. So while you think you don't have a lot to share, you have a lot to share. And then I give the shield to their master tech, which you know, for us is a, the technician who's assigned to them. Their shift gives them their shield because their shift invested so much into them. And your hope is that, you know, that does the parts into them is that understanding is, hey, and now I'm part of this tribe. I have accountability. I have to be able to contribute. And we can't diminish that, right? I mean, it's so, so vitally important. Oh, Dan, I think that's, uh, that's very profound. I couldn't agree more. Sam, any closing thoughts? We'll go on my screen. We'll go from Sam to Kate to Daryl, Mike, Chief Hovelman, and uh, Will here. I don't know if the boss is still on, but uh, Sam, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I would say um, in the fire service, because we're a paramilitary organization, one of the most difficult um, things of a formal mentoring program is how do you teach somebody fortitude? Because as a formal mentoring program, are you not going to tell them you need to listen to your officers, you need to listen to that senior private? And then they go out to a negative company or they go out to a company who thinks all things are common sense and, and they're conflicted because they've been told to, uh, to emulate that company. They've been told to listen to uh, their ideology. And so I, I think that that's where we lose a lot of our people as opposed to that, uh, that receiver or that, that person looking to be mentoring, going out and finding the people that they want. Mm -hmm. Good. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, and the best of luck to your son who's uh, on the job there in Wichita. And uh, I know you've been burning it up out there. Kate, again, thanks very much for, uh, for your willingness to come on and, and participate and bring things to the table. Any closing thoughts? Yeah, I just think, you know, thanks again for having me. I, I, it's been a real pleasure to listen to everybody. Um, <clears throat> I just think that uh, when I started the, at, at the front of the hour, I was talking about the bad old days and I do see progress over time that, 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 um, that there have been improvements, but there still needs to be a process towards maintaining people as they get into that upper level to remember how it felt to be coming in and seeing those crusty guys and saying, I'm not going to be like that and making sure they don't get there. And so that they can then turn around and look at the people coming up behind them in a way that we would have wished for if we didn't get that on our way up. Thanks, Kate. My Captain pleasure. Mike? Any yeah, closing I thoughts, think, Captain Mike? I just think, uh, listen, mentoring is a great thing. And you should be a mentor. Everyone should be a mentor. Uh, we have a saying in the FDNY, every person is an example. Some for the good, some for the bad. You can be a mentor. Do it. But you have to stay humble. Okay? Whatever you do, whatever your accolade is, whatever your uh, thing is in your job, there is somebody doing it better someplace else. Okay? So if, you're, if you think you've arrived, retire, because you're only going to get yourself or somebody else hurt, okay? It's all about staying teachable, staying alert, and staying alive. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Chief Hobelman. Yeah, uh, great conversation. And I think uh, it's hard to, to add much to what's already been said, and, but I would just kind of echo that uh, there has to be some purpose, purposefulness uh, from the mentor to recognize moments that are teachable, the, that, that you can share those things. Um, and you can only do that if you do have that humility and the, uh, the, the thoughtfulness that you're still learning. Um, again, I, I think one of the biggest things I've learned from those that have mentored me, um, mostly informally, is the inquisitiveness and the, the listening and the questions that um, they, they guide the mentee to the, what they're looking for. Um, and so I would, that's one thing I would add. Thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure meeting and listening to Kate. Um, and um, I've already forgotten his name. I apologize. <laughs> that's what happens when you get put behind a desk. Uh, Sam, Sam Hannell. That's his name. <laughs> Daryl, my brother, are you working a full 24? Full 24. Yep. Yeah. Even though we changed the 4896 schedule. 
uh, about a year ago, maybe two years now. Uh, I don't know how you guys do it in a busy house. That's, uh, you know, I could do that as a young man, but for 48 hours with no sleep, whew, that that's tough, man. Yeah, so, um, anyway, hey, yeah. uh, very insightful. Uh, any final thoughts? Yeah, just um, a couple things. Is one is uh, if somebody's asking you questions or, or trying to get advice from you, um, at that moment in time, maybe formally, they're not thinking about it, but they're looking upon you because they feel like you have some type of special knowledge. At that point in time, you are a, a mentor or advisor or something to that person. So uh, respect that, that that's what they, they're looking for. So some people are looking at these probationaries as fresh meat and you know, you know, gonna, gonna beat them to death for everything that they don't know. Um, it, it, that needs to go away, you know, um, or you're not going to be able to pass on any of your knowledge, as I said before, but for everybody else out there, uh, I, I think we've said it, but just remain open-minded and realize that there's a lot of resources out there to seek out any information, uh, uh, that you're looking for. And it, it doesn't have to be your own organization. It could be another department and some of my mentors are you know, over here in San Francisco next to us or in, even in some of the suburban departments. And they don't have to be from a busy firefighting place for whatever you're looking for. There's a lot of knowledgeable people out there. So it's about hey, it. Captain. What would you like to say, Sam? Go ahead, yeah, brother. I would, I would just like to say, um, and, and this kind of ties a lot of this together. A lot of people complain about the youth. Um, they're not loyal to the uh, department. They're not loyal to the company like our parents were. Um, but they are loyal to people. Um, and so it goes back to if you do take that time to invest in them and, and teach them something that's valuable, something that benefits them, um, and then they start to reflect what's important to you, then you can ultimately make them loyal to the department as well by proxy. And I think that's overlooked when we complain about the youth. Uh, I actually think it's a, a tremendous um, asset or an ability to reach them directly. To, uh, to make them useful to the organization. Sam, I, I, I gotta add to that. I 100% agree with you. When I hear somebody blaming issues on new people, new people will do whatever you want them to do. They want to just know what to do. They will join the Marines and get shot running up a hill with people getting shot around them. They fight our wars, new people are great. We just have to make sure that we let them know what is expected of them. Bobby Halton said uh, in a, I, I attended one of his classes in Fort Lauderdale. He says, we criticize millennials. Who do you think that is? Uh, the, the landing signal officer on an aircraft carrier guiding in that F-18 Hornet. It's a millennial for God's sake. So, and I know that these young folks here in this academy are better firefighters now and probably better people Definitely my kids are better people than I was at their age. So it's, uh, I think we're painting with a very big, broad brush. Did we cover everybody? Did we give everybody final thought? Dan, anything final? No, nah, everyone hit it, man. Just okay, so we're going to have, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to, you're going to be, oh, shout out to Key. That's keyhose.com. Take the key challenge. You can't kink. Key, take a look at your response district. Ask yourself on every EMS run, whenever you're out, how would we get a line in here? And also, where are we going to stretch and charge this hose before we enter the fire area? And if you don't predicate everything on just three lengths of hose, uh, when you, you could take five or six lengths of hose, depending upon uh, the, the distance of stairways and that type of thing. So uh, think about that. And uh, if, you, if you, or you have a tight spot, hose like key is going to give you uh, your best bang for the buck because you, you can't kink it. You can coil it if that's what you have to do. Okay. Senor. That's great. Well, first and foremost, thank you for having me on. And uh, it was a pleasure meeting everybody here. Uh, a lot of respect for everybody that's on the board. 
I uh, would like to close with just one small thing. So at five years as a firefighter, I started to feel comfortable about the job. Almost felt like I had enough calls that I was, I was good. Nobody comes and tells you, oh, by the way, uh, you're the senior guy. Oh, by the way, you're the mentor of that probing. You know, I think the hardest part is figuring out on your own that, well, it's me, you know? I, you're in a drill and they ask around, right, anybody got something to say? And you want to say something, but you're like, oh, no, I'm, I feel like I'm the junior guy. Well, be that guy or that gal that's going to say something because nobody chooses who's going to be the mentor. You know, you understand that I got a duty. I'm going to share everything that I've learned, you know, with with the uh, experience that I've gained in units and calls. And I need to share that information. I think that's the hardest part of being a mentor is not being chosen as a mentor. It's you have to come out willing to teach and learn. Not everybody could do it. I'm going to be honest. I've worked around a lot of great instructors, but I've also worked around some instructors. You're like, maybe you shouldn't teach, you know, but again, I think that's the biggest thing is knowing when it's your turn and stepping up to that plate because, uh, Every single firefighter that leaves that station is going to appreciate whatever it is that you added after that drill or, uh, or in the meeting. But thank you for having me again. I appreciate it. Till next month. God bless. Keep you safe. Keep you healthy. And uh, for God's sake, keep healthy. <laughs> and uh, don't let your guard down. Okay. We're starting to see the uh, reduction somewhat of the, the virus. Mm -hmm. Uh, now is not the time to be complacent by any means. So I know that uh, when we get finished with our uh, dissertation, I have an official Miami-Dade <laughs> fire rescue mask. And I can go in the grocery store with this mask on because I now know that if somebody has a heart attack, I just had my CPR training <laughs> and I'll be able to do it. So. Thank you and God bless everybody. We'll see you next month.